Well, who is God sending you to in this season? Who's he sending you to in this season? To love, to encourage, to challenge, to disciple. I wanted to commend you as the church recently, getting out of the seats, into the streets. You're, you're in your businesses. You're in your schools. You're understanding that the time is short. It's getting darker and darker. And you guys are on mission wherever the, the Lord sends you. One of my friends at this church, him and his wife started a new business and told me this story about how it's an online business they're connecting, and there was a guy they connected with, he's 48 years old, has cirrhosis of the liver, has two years, the doctors gave him two years, and he's super far from God, and, and there was a perfect opportunity to share Christ with this man who's in desperate need of some type of hope. I commend you. I commend you that took city service seriously. I mean, I heard stories. I think my mom and her crew went to the fire station and just prayed for the firemen. Thank you for what you do as you serve the community. Some of you guys went to the police station, prayed for the police officers. Come on, somebody. What do we do? We're, we're, we're serving, we're reaching, we're praying for, we're encouraging. We're hearing stories, taking time to hear stories. Some of y'all are crazy people. You went and gave Krispy Kreme to the high school students. Please, teachers, forgive us for that. I don't know what we were thinking. <laughs> Manna from heaven was coming down at the local high schools. Last, I think it was last Friday, we had a uh, block party in Valley. And it was so cool. I, I love watching my wife when we have these outreach opportunities. She has such a heart to connect with people and hear their story. And I just saw her at a picnic bench and Tara, thank you for all your leadership, by the way. Can we give up for our Love Out Loud director, Tara Ralphs? Thank you. It's been a blessing to have you meet us. And we didn't do anything of the organization. We just showed up with a heart to serve. And it was so cool. I was observing my wife, and she was just sitting at this table with a family. She had a, like a, a little baby loving on her and getting her story, just, just listening to her. And it was genuine. The, the love of Christ was flowing through her. She got to invite her, I think, uh, to Agape, to the Women's Connection on a Monday night. She came. The lady came. And you just, you just look at this and you go, man, what, what, what is she going through right now? What is she struggling with? And listen, I just want to look at all of y'all. You are the church. You have the hope. I have the hope that we need. It's, it's only found in Christ. You're the bridge. I'll remind you of uh, one of the last phrases that Jesus, when he commanded his church, if you're a Christian in here today and you're online, you're the church. Yeah, I know you're not in the building, but you're, you're the online church. This is for you too. In Matthew 28, Jesus said, go and make disciples. He didn't say stay or attend church every now and again. He said, man, go and make disciples. And then later on in 29, he says, and then teach them and I'll be with you. I love that. Like, it's such a clear command. And so you and I, in this season, I'm asking, okay, who is God sending you to reach, to disciple, to hear their story, to love, to share your story, give them hope? Listen, I don't care what you're addicted to right now. I don't care what is going on in your life. I don't care how bad your marriage is, is right now. I can give you hope because I know who is the author of hope. What happens is there's something that shifts and we're on mission. And by the way, and you're alive. At this church, we say, we say if you're a healthy Christian, you're surrendered, surrounded, spirit-led, self-fed, and sent. That's the title of this message. And I'll, find, I'll just be honest with you, man. I can get wrapped up in the things of this world. I'm a little materialistic. Any materialistic people struggle with that a little bit? And sometimes I can get all about my world. And what ends up happening is my soul begins to just kind of start zapping. You know what I'm talking about? Because I'm not, I'm not living in how God created me to be. And I repent, and I'm like, God, get me back on track. And the fact is, God is sending us on mission to specific people. You can reach people that I can't. Mandy, like, 
you know, doing the dough thing, the bread thing. Like, there's ladies. I don't know, you know. That's a ministry. Get your, bake your bread on and, like, to the glory of God and reach people. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go and bake bread with a bunch of ladies and try to share Christ with them. But you can. But think about it. If every one of us in this church go, instead of, like, putting up a, well, Todd was a 7.5 today, you know, like, okay. How about we just turn this and we go, you know what? It's not about attending the church and judging the pastor or the worship. It's about reaching people and discipling people. Can you imagine what would happen if, if this shifted in our life? You go, why, how does this connect to Ezekiel? I'm glad you asked because as you were reading in Ezekiel, you saw that God got a hold of Ezekiel and gave him a clear call to, to speak to the captives it, by the river Kibar. And let me just give you some context. God's people, his chosen people, they started off good. You remember one of the, the best kings of Israel, David? You remember David? Things were, were just flowing. He passed it on to Solomon. And they were following God's ways, his laws that Moses gave them. They were following his playbook. Everything was flowing well. And then Solomon got a little off track. And then the kingdom divided after Solomon passed it on. You had this, his son Rehoboam took the part, part of the kingdom. Jeroboam took the other part. There were 10 tribes went one way. Two tribes went south. You had Israel and Judah, and they divided. Things got a little worse. And they, they veered off God's best, and God warned them through prophets. If you continue down this road, I'm going to have to give you the rod of discipline. And he used the Assyrians to come in and conquer Israel in 722 BC and completely wrecked them, took them away to Assyria and scattered them, and the nation just was scattered. Their life was just wild. It was the rod of discipline. It was God's judgment. He had been trying to warn them, kind of like you do with your kids, you're like, guys, this is the best way. And they're like, yeah, whatever. And they do their own thing and you have to give them like, you know, timeouts and, you know, detentions. Wait, that's at school. But in any event, that's what happened. And then the southern kingdom of Judah started straying. They didn't learn from the northern kingdom. And God was sending prophets to say, turn, man, there's something better for you. Uh, please do this. I don't want to have to give you discipline. And what did they do? They're like, yeah, like us humans, ah, I'm going to do my own thing. And so for three different waves, God sent the Babylonians to come and conquer the southern kingdom of Judah. If you're a history buff, you can go and check it out. In 605 BC was the first wave where they came in and they took guys like Daniel. Remember Daniel? Daniel, the young, influential hip dude goes into Babylon and becomes part of the royal court and they trained him in the, the king's court. That's in 605. 597 was the second wave, the second siege and they brought a whole nother group of people, Ezekiel being one of them. And they bring them to this refugee camp in Babylon. <laughs> Can you imagine, by the way, like if some, some country comes in three different waves and takes groups of the United States, let's say the Canadians. I don't know, I don't wanna pick on Canadians, but they're just, they're like, yeah, God's gonna use the Canadians to ransack you strange Americans. And three different waves, Ezekiel's in, one, in that wave, 597, and then eventually in 586 BC, all of Judah is taken captive to Babylon. There's only a few farmers left back to take care of the ground. I wanted to give you that context because in this text that we're reading, Ezekiel, the prophet, is one of the captives in Babylon. And as he's there with the people, he gets this vision in chapter one of the glory of God. Did you read that, by the way? I mean, and you see all these angelic beings, and the angelic beings have like these, these like huge rims. They're like, like spinners. They're like, God, it's like God's got bling and spinners. I don't know if you guys caught that. That was pretty wild. And then in chapter two, he gets the call. And I want to show you this call. It's, it's chapter two, starting in verse one. He says this, stand up, son of man. Because by the way, in, in chapter one, if you get 
hit with the glory of God and the presence of God, there's one way that you go. <laughs> You're on your face. Think about this, holy, perfect, powerful God. He has this interaction with the glory of God, bam, he's on his face. And so now God's speaking to him by his spirit in chapter two, he says, stand up, son of man, said the voice. I wanna speak with you. The spirit, watch this, came into me as he spoke. A picture of the Holy Spirit descending on his church. He set me on my feet. I listened carefully to his words. By the way, before you and I go out and we're sent to reach people, just know this, we have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter one, verse eight, you shall receive what? Power. We, we, we don't just try to strive to reach people. It's God's spirit through us. We'll, it will, we'll be filled with power. Then you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the world. So verse three, son of man, I'm sending you to the nation of Israel, a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. <laughs> they and their ancestors have been rebelling against me to this very day. Did I just tell you the history of the rebellion? Sounds just like you and I, doesn't it? They are a stubborn and heart-hearted people. But I'm sending you, there it is, to say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or refuse to listen, for remember, they're rebels, like how many times has he gotta say the same thing? At least they will know they have had a prophet among them. Sounds like a great call, thank you God. Send me to all the rebellious people. <laughs> Sounds like some of us parents right now, right? Whether they listen or not. Verse six, son of man, don't fear them or their words. Don't be afraid even though their threats surround you like nettles or briars or stinging scorpions. Do not be dismayed by their dark scowls even though they are rebels. It's kind of like when you're trying to love someone and share Christ at work and you just get the scowl right there. You must give them my messages whether they listen or not. But they won't listen for they're completely rebellious. Oh my goodness. Don't you, don't you just your heart just break for people like Ezekiel? Just imagine again, you're captive, you were taken from your homeland, you're, you're held captive in Babylon and God's speaking to you, he's giving you your call. Hey, the people right there with you, uh, speak to them the messages I'm gonna give you and by the way, they're rebellious and they won't listen. Many times I feel like, just like this as a preacher, I'm like, I'm, I'm preparing all week. God speaks to me, and everybody, like, you're just like, no. <laughs> but here's what I wanna tell you. This is so good. It's the most freeing feeling as a pastor to, or, or preacher or you as a Christian to say, all I wanna do is be faithful to what God's asked me to do. Whether or not you respond does not determine if I have a successful ministry. The people at your work, at, you know, at school, whether they respond or not, if we are building bridges by God's grace and love and modeling what it is to be Christ-like and sharing the gospel, whether or not people respond or not does not impact your faithfulness or your reward. That's hard for me to think because I'm thinking of numbers. Like just, you know, it's, it's not about that. I've often heard it was said as a Christian evangelist or preacher we're on salary, not on commission. What is that? Like, hey man, it doesn't matter how many notches you get in your belt, how many salvations, it's based on our obedience to share the message. So Ezekiel gets this. And what I love about this text, and I'm just gonna give you three, three keys to the preparation of a preacher. And you go, I'm not a preacher, I'm not a pastor. If you're a Christian, yes you are. Okay? You, you might not wanna get on stage with a mic, but listen, if you have the heart of God and he's flowing through you and you care for people, you are a preacher. I've often said this, man, like the best evangelists are the people that, man, you were wrecked, God saved you. You can't not share what God did in your life. I, it's like this guy recently, he came to me, he said, Todd, have you had the New York style pizza off of you know, so-and-so road here? It just came here. I didn't know about it. it is the, it's like New York came down to Omaha. It's the best. 
You got to go now. And I'm like, dude, he's convinced. <laughs> Guess what? That's the powerful evangelist is when you like, I, I just got to tell you what God did in my life. I'm not making something up or the pastor told me to. It's like, holy smokes, I was dead. Now I'm alive. I was wrecked. There was no reason I should be here right now, but I'm alive. I'm convinced. I'm called. I'm the pizza evangelist. You know what I'm saying? Like, what in the world? So, okay, chill out. Just say, chill out, Todd. So I want to give you this little, this thing I saw in the scripture. I think it's super powerful for effective ministry when we're sent to reach people. It's kind of like, um, I saw this thing on Patrick Mahomes. Before he prepares for a game, he goes through the same routine to get ready for the game. I wanna give you the Pat Mahomes evangelist routine as you are sent into your schools, into the gym, wherever God sends you. Number one, consume. Someone say consume. consume. And consume the right thing, by the way. Devour, eternalize, internalize. Really zone in on the scriptures. Watch this. Ezekiel 2, starting in verse eight. Son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not join them in the rebellion. Remember, put yourself in his shoes. You're right there with them. Listen to what I say to you. Don't join in the rebellion. Open your mouth and eat. There it is. Eat what I give you. Then I looked and I saw a hand reaching out to me. It held a scroll, which he unrolled. The Bible wasn't a book back then. It was like God's word, like these messages. It was like this parchment. It was in a scroll form. He, he gives it to him. He unrolls it. I saw on both sides were covered with funeral songs, words of sorrow, and pronouncements of doom. So he gets this, and let me just pause real quick, and I, I need to speak this. As I was studying this, you know, God's word is his playbook of life. He created us. He knows how life works the best. He gives us his laws, his word. Why? Not to be restrictive, but to be, to be protective. He says, this is how life works. This is how marriage works. This is how life works. And when we follow that, life is not easy, but it works out. When we say, you know what, God, I'm not going to go by your law. I'm going to go by my own. What ends up happening is we unnecessarily bring all kinds of pain and discomfort and gnarliness to our own life. And I feel like that's what's happening is he's reading these messages. God was trying to get their attention for many years, so patient. And eventually he is obviously correcting them through the Babylonian invasion. And, and, and he's, he's internalizing this. And I was just thinking of God's heart is so broken it's not like God's up in heaven going, you know what, I can't wait for my kids to get out of line. I can't wait to just beat them up. And someone needs to hear that. That's how I picture God in the day. Let me give you a scripture to confirm what I'm saying to you. 2 Peter 3.9. This is one of my favorites. 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. Anybody grateful for the patience of God in, in your life? Oh my goodness. But here's, here's what I wanted you to see. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. We back away from this word repent. He's like, oh, I made you. I know how you work. You're walking this way on your own. God, I got life on my own. And now He's like, ah, you're walking into destruction. All I want you to do is what? Turn. Repentance is turn. Change the way you think about who I am and my game plan for you. Chapter three, now let's move on. Verse one, Ezekiel three, verse one says on this idea of consuming. The voice said to me, son of man, eat what I'm giving you. Eat this scroll. Then go, I used to eat at this place called Eat Fit Go, I like that. It's eat the scroll, consume it, then go and give the message. And that is a key when we are being sent. If we're not saturating in the scriptures before we are sent by God's spirit, we got our own mind, our own thoughts, we get legalistic, pointing fingers as opposed to having the heart of God. Then go and give the message to the people. So I opened my mouth. And he fed me the scroll. I had this picture of like a fruit roll-up. You know, it's like he's just downing it. Fill your stomach with this. 
And when I ate it, it tasted sweet as honey in my mouth. Now remember, he's not taking the parchment paper, putting some ketchup on it, you know, and downing it. But this idea of you and I, before we're sent out, we're, we're getting with God in his word. And he says it's sweet to the taste. This, this, I'll tell you, back in the 90s, <laughs> golly, I, I'm dating myself. When I first began serving in ministry, I was volunteering in youth ministry. And there was this real humble guy that I loved. His name was Paul. Everybody say Paul. Paul. And Paul was just one of those guys you love. Humble, genuine, servant, faithful, consistent. And all the kids loved him. And I looked at Paul one day. I'm like, Paul, what's your secret? I'm prideful. I'm a jerk at times. Like, I want to be you, Paul. And he, he looked at me and he said, Chuck tapes. Chuck tapes? The heck does that mean, man? And then he would just keep on walking, talking about Chuck tapes. Well, to give you, hold on, for young people, just so you know, there used to be this thing called a cassette tape. It was this thing, it was weird. You stuck it in this box and you pushed play. And like, what he was referring to is there was a guy named Pastor Chuck Smith who started the very first Calvary Chapel. And all he did was open the, the Bible in Genesis and would just read and teach very simply through the entire Bible. And Paul said, Chuck tapes. And what I ended up understanding is in, at church, they had a section of the church where you could go buy Pastor Chuck's through the Bible series on cassette tape. And so I went there, and dude, it was this huge box of cassette tapes. And I'm like, if, Paul, if it worked for Paul, I'm doing it. So I would train, I would have a workout, I'd go up in the loft of my house in Fort Lauderdale, my little townhouse, and I would drink this uh, protein shake, and I would grab my Bible, and I just started reading, I started going through the Bible, one day at a time, consuming God's word, and a protein shake, and I'd get about 30, 45 minutes up in my loft, and I just, Chuck's like, let's turn now to Genesis, you know, like, I'd wake up, I had like, you know, protein shake coming out of the corner of my mouth, you know, like, and uh, the word of God was, that protein shake was sweet to my taste, but it was all, that word of God started becoming internalized and deep in my soul and began changing me from the inside out. I, I started grasping concepts of who God is and his sovereignty and his love for me, and I'm like, I gotta share this. It began maturing me and deep in my soul. I was, I was no longer having a devo. I was devouring. See, you see what I did with that devour, right? Like, it's your devo time, right? How many, you've had a devo where it's like, yeah, and I'm out, right? Like any, all of us probably have had. How about we devour the scriptures, our sustenance? You want to be a counselor? You know what your key is? Consume. Let the Spirit speak through you. You try to go counsel with your own good ideas. I try to preach with my own good ideas. It will do nothing for you. If I'm consuming the scripture and then giving the message, now something changes lives. Verse 10, Ezekiel 3 and 10, he added, son of man, let all my words sink deep into your own heart first. So good. Listen to them carefully for yourself. Let me just remind you, your faith is not your, your family's faith. It's not your friend's faith. It's your faith. And you can have as much of God as you want. We, we are very fortunate in this country. We, we live in a free country. You can read the Bible all day long. You can download the Chuck Smith app, and you can get as many messages as you want. Some people will say, well, we're not deep enough here. You can get deep for eight hours a day if you want. Get deep. Let it sink into your own heart first. Then go to your people in exile and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Do this whether they listen to you or not. The people you're reaching right now, whether they listen or not. And by the way, let me just say this. There, I've seen this in my life. If you lovingly continue to share God's word with people, you never know what season of life they get to where they hit a rough patch and they call you. 
They might disregard what you're saying now, but listen, there'll be a day where they'll reach out to you. Are you ready? So number one, consume. Number two, compassion. And I'll just be very honest with you. Sometimes, if I'm not careful, I can miss this. And to me, I would say this is a major key of reaching people is compassion, is care, is connection. Now, chapter three, verse 12. So remember, put yourself in his shoes. He's getting these words, this call from God. He's eating this scroll. He's eternalizing God's messages. And now God's sending him. Verse 12, the spirit lifted me up and I heard a loud rumbling sound behind me. May the glory of the Lord be praised in his place. It was the sound of the wings of the living beings in chapter one as they brushed against each other and the rumbling of their wheels beneath them, like a NASCAR event. The spirit lifted me up and took me away. I went in bitterness and turmoil, but the Lord's hold on me was strong. Let me just say, by the way, sometimes the thing God's called you to and who to reach is the last thing that you would actually wanna do. But the beauty is when God's hand is strong upon you, you can work through the uncomfortable and know I need to speak to someone, I need to share with someone, super uncomfortable, but I need to lean in anyways. God's hand was strong on him. Verse 15, then I, I came to the colony of the Judean exiles, this refugee camp in Tel Aviv, beside the Kibar River. And this is what I wanted to show you. This is what really jumped out to me. I was overwhelmed and sat among them for seven days. In another translation, it said, I sat where they sat. Don't, let, don't, don't just let that sit for a second. I sat where they sat and remained astonished among them seven days. This is such a key thing. Now remember, can you imagine what those people were thinking? I'm, I'm just picturing like homeless families that used to have things going on in Jerusalem and now they find themselves in an enemy camp, stripped, have nothing, and they're sitting in this place of being completely overwhelmed. And God gives this word to Ezekiel, go speak to my people. It's gonna be a kind of hard word that I'm gonna give you to speak to them. And I love it. He doesn't just show up and be like, you idiots. How'd you get us in this place? It's all your fault and I'm here with you. God says, no, no, no. Go and just sit with them for seven days. Do not say a word, sit and be silent. And let me just say this. If we are a Christian right now and we are talking even the truth, the hard truths of God, but we haven't sat with someone to hear their story and what they're struggling with, be very careful, Christian. One of the things that really hurts my heart is preachers who are just firing off in an online church about someone struggling in their sexuality, but they're not willing to sit across the table and hear how they were abused as kids and they grew up confused and they're really struggling in their sexuality. They don't have the conversation, they just fire off God's word. Although it is true, but it's with no heart or no humility and no understanding of what they're struggling with. If, if we could have maybe just some, just sit and listen to someone's story. One of my favorite things right now, just, this just happened. I was sitting in a group of men, grown men, and one man was so vulnerable about his story. And I said, you know what? I, I'm so grateful to hear that, man. That puts me in your shoes. I, I would say, put, put yourself in their shoes before you say a word. Sit before we speak. It blew me away. I, I've, I've dealt with addiction. I know what it is. It's, it's, maybe you struggle with overeating and God has done something miraculous and he's freed you from that and you see someone else struggling in the same area. How about instead of judging them, how about you go and help them? 
What, what ends up happening is something shifts in the church, and now people, instead of going, oh my goodness, that's the weird, holier-than-thou Christian, something shifts, and they go, you know what? Man, there's something different about that person. They're not judging me. They're trying to help me because they really believe God's got something better for me. That changes. And that's what he does. He sits for seven days. Isn't that Jesus? Jesus, the one full of compassion. In Matthew 9, 36, the text says this, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Powerful. Jesus had the heart. How about we have the heart of Jesus and we're looking at people who are like, they're not, they're not necessarily bad people. They're confused. They're lost. They're sheep. Bah, right? Just all of us. It's just kind of just going through life. And we don't know any better at times. And Jesus is the great shepherd. He's like, hey, just follow me, man. I'll get you back on track. That's the idea. It's consume. It's compassion. And then we communicate. In that order, then, number three, we communicate. Ezekiel 3, now 16, So we try to land this plane after seven days, and I, I underline that in my Bible, after seven days, after the Lord gave me a message, he said, son of man, I've appointed you as a watchman for Israel. Whenever you receive a message from me, warn people immediately. It's interesting just to understand contextually what was happening too. There were false prophets in Babylon saying, hey, don't worry about it. We're actually gonna get some help from Egypt and we're gonna, we're gonna wipe out the Babylonians. You're gonna be freed any time now. It was a false prophecy. Jeremiah was actually writing to them saying, hey guys, just make houses, relax for a while. You're gonna be for 70 years. And all this false prophecy was happening and Ezekiel is called to confirm that and warn them and just say, guys, get back on track. He was a watchman. Verse 18, if I warn the wicked, saying you're under the penalty of death, but you fail to deliver the warning, they'll die in their sins and I'll hold you responsible for their deaths. Ah. And then in verse 19, if you warn them and they refuse to repent and keep on sinning, watch this. They'll die in their sins, but you will have saved yourself. Why? Because you, because you obeyed me. The picture he's giving Ezekiel, in those times, a watchman was someone, their role, they would have these small cities with kind of like some fences and walls around them, and they would get up in this, this kind of like high post, and their job, the watchman, guess what? That's all they would do all the time. They'd have like a night you know, nighttime, and, they, and all they would do is, they're looking for the enemies. If there's any enemy that's gonna come, what would they do? Dudes, the enemy's coming, we gotta do something about it, it's impending doom, do something about it. And if they're like, ah, I'm sleeping, man, don't worry about it, <laughs> that's on them. But if they're like, imagine the watchman was like, oh, snap, dude, they're coming to get us. Ah, uh, I don't really like those guys anyway, I'll just... Let them get wrecked. <laughs> then their blood was on his head. That's what God was saying to him. He said, hey man, just obey me. Give my message. Warn the people. Listen, you're gonna be here in Babylon, Babylonia for a while. Settle in. Turn from serving these false gods. Something will be okay. God will still protect you even in this place. I love it. We care, we communicate, he converts in his timing. And, I'll, and I'll, find, I'll land the plane with this really cool story. A few weeks ago on a Sunday morning, we were, having a, we were just praying before church early on, got some of our leaders together, and uh, Pastor Mike O'Connell, who, God bless him, I, don't you just love Pastor Mike, man, I just love that dude, so good. He celebrated his birthday this week. Mike, if you're watching, Jay, love you guys. And he was leading the meeting, and he just, he had this sense from God, talk about a message from God, that there was gonna be a young man that was gonna show up to, 
this was a few weeks ago, at church, who was hurting so bad he was thinking of taking his life. And he needed to hear someone warn him about heaven and hell, but that there's a beautiful opportunity to come to Christ and be saved. He, he, had, he just sensed this really strong, this message from God. He gave it to us, we prayed. We went through that day. I gave this opportunity for people to come to Christ. After the 11, and this young man responded, and he said, one of our leaders was leading him to Christ, and he said, I was about to pull the trigger last night, or I was about to take my life last night, and for whatever reason, I had this sense that I needed to be here, and the guy said yes to Jesus Christ. Yeah. And for all eternity, he's going to heaven. And I'm, like, I'm like, man, this is happening all over the place. The, the team just gave me this message that in season two, in four months at this church, over 600 people have made decisions for Christ. That's in four months through, through all of us together as a family, as we're on mission, as we're inviting, as we're sharing these messages. I want to honor Pastor Cap, our online pastor, giving these messages all over the world that God, it doesn't matter where you're at, God can forgive you. He can set you free. In a lot of ways, we're just like Ezekiel. We're called to go share with the captives. We're watchmen. You don't have to stay captive. You can be free in Christ. Amen? Lord, thank you for this message. And in the Old Testament, <laughs> Ezekiel here still speaking to us so faithfully as we're reading together, as we're serving together, sent by your spirit to so many different spaces and places to reach your people who you've been patient with, you love. You're not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And so even now we pray that would happen for your glory in Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I wanna land the plane